there was a hard rock scene that sort of had been defining, I think, most of Tucson's rock and roll. And of course, you had the country thing, which was like um, Dusty Chaps, George Hawk, it, it was uh, Ned Sutton. And so there, that was really happening. Bob Meehan, those guys played at, at, at different bars than, than the hard rock bars. The United States just had had Watergate. So we were in a strange time, very cynical kind of a dark time. People were all sort of defining themselves to the music, you know? And we weren't really a punk band, really, at all, but I liked the idea of it, uh, the idea of punk, and, and, um, and it was sort of what everything was gravitating towards the, this change, you know, or this whatever it was, you know? Um, but that, that huge bulgy thing that had gotten really gross, like sort of prog rock and stuff, this was sort of the answer to that, just stripped down, you know, and um, with with it with a lot of attitude, whether it was uh, good or, or not, you know. <laughs> Days go by, nothing changes. We're still the same. So much potential. something I've always wanted to do. You know, I have my record label and I've put out records since the Sidewinders' first album in 1988. I'm a big fan of trying to curate uh, and preserve Tucson music. We're all getting older and so I just really wanted to do this project as sort of like my way of saying thank you and this is what Tucson music means to me. These are the bands that helped inspire me in a certain way to get going myself and pick up the guitar and get going. It's a tribute to Tucson music. There's a certain amount of joy I, I have about pulling off the greatest Tucson compilation I've ever done. And all these bands mean something to me. Tucson was awash in drug money, so a lot of people were at the bars, and consequently there were a lot of bars. There were some good bands there, though. What was good about it was they, they were willing to play it on the radio. This was really almost before the cocaine days. When the cocaine days arrived, and it was considerably more debauched. I, I had already probably been there about two years by the time the coke started showing up, and it took a turn for the unpleasant. Tucson 1977 wasn't nearly as cool as it was in 19... 67, but that's the nature of Sunbelt cities. They keep getting worse and worse. There were a lot of places to play. There were a lot of bands playing every night. There were a lot of musicians making a living playing in Tucson. There's a real vibrant scene of people filling up clubs. I think it was largely fueled by the drug trade because so many drugs came through Tucson. And so there were all these young millionaires. But yeah, there were these guys with names like Pineapple and Toad who were 20 years old and had a million dollars. It came through Mexico and came through Tucson and then went to wherever it went. When we were in Tucson, we'd play every night. The places would be packed. It had been that way in the 60s too, but in the 70s it was like that. And of course, it was in between the birth control pill and AIDS. So this is a very good time for people to go out and meet people and have fun. But it was great. I mean, we, we had a wonderful time. We could play original music and make lots of money and then play to appreciative crowds. And, and you, by the time you parked and got, got your instrument ready and got in the door, you were just stoned. <laughs> in, in a period of about 50 feet.
It's here, man, here, man. And so it was a lot of fun. There was a lot of brain damage in those days. As a matter of fact, I, I'm paying for various things now. But it was it was innocent. They were they were different up in Phoenix. You know, back then there was still a political difference. Tucson was more of a, sort of a hippie town, and also we weren't into the hard drugs. Like you know, Phoenix was sort of a different scene. You know, where they were all like into heroin and stuff. I, I, I we were we were all just sort of beer and pot and. You know, sure, there was some parties at Surfer Hollow where maybe too many quaaludes went around. But, you know, nobody ever, uh, nobody ever, you know, wound up uh, uh, doing something psychotic and hurting a bunch of people on, on quaaludes. When I got here in 70, latter part of 76, it was like a little oasis of music, real diverse music scene here and a lot of clubs. There was a rock scene and a, and everybody kind of went to everybody else's scene. But I mean, Fourth Avenue was kind of the rock thing, more of a hard rock thing. And then the pawnbroker was kind of more like the California sound. Yeah, I was living in, in Tucson and playing at what had become our home base bar called the pawnbroker. We had recorded an album at Leafer's studio down there for very little money, and we started trying to send it around. And after many months of getting no responses, uh, a guy from Capitol Records called and said he wanted to fly in and see us. So he came to the pawnbroker, and by the end of that week, we were signed to Capitol. You know, there were there were different categories of clubs at that time. There was also a pretty serious jazz scene here in town. And Tucson, actually, because of the School of Music, really had a lot of of serious musicians as well, not just the, the guys that learned three chords and were, were playing, you know, the, the, the punk scene. Boy, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that you could go and see on any given night a whole plethora of different styles not just bands but but stylistically there was a there was a lot of stuff out there there really was the oxbow was uh home away from home you know plenty of ouzo and and a few pool tables and and just a great crowd yeah it was it was quite quite uh, the times back then you know you'd have one club owner that was a certain way and have another one that was more more of a uh, not a, that nice of a guy it was when you are talking to band guys and go, you know, we're just not, they're not coming to hear us like they used to. And the next thing you knew is the thing was had burned down. Just uh, for some reason, it caught on fire and <laughs> burned right to the ground. The pedestrians were like kind of a sort of a new wave, like modern kind of cover band. And they, they got a gig at this place called the Pearls Hurricane downtown, which was uh, unusual. It was like, wasn't a venue normally. There was a rowdy crowd, and they all wanted to beat up the punk rockers. So I get to, you know, I get to pretend like I fought somebody or whatever. The hurricane was right downtown. At that time, it was like the Esquire, uh, the Manhattan, there was a little, uh, like a little porn shop where you put in change and the th thing goes up. Everything was very different. There's places for ID, a pawn shop where they ran a lot of hot jewelry. And, uh, and behind that was Myra Street and all these, va this vadio, you know. And uh, so it was really, um, really different downtown than it is now. The hurricane was sort of uh, the, the leftovers bar. It wasn't much um, 
Like it wasn't like a hip bar at all. The lady that ran it was named Pearl. Well, she looked like she lived life pretty, pretty fast and pretty hard. But the first time we played there, we filled, we, we filled the place. And so that sort of showed, I guess, that where there was this scene where people were defining themselves through this music, you know. Pearl uh, of Pearl's Hurricane, she had the perpetual cigarette on her lip like she, if she said something, it'd be like, la, 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 you know. That. She didn't greet us warmly. Oh, no, no. no. She wasn't she was warm. <laughs> 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 yes, but she made some money. I don't think she gave a damn what kind of music that was going on there. She just uh, liked to, to have a couple hundred people packing in her little place with a capacity of about 70, you know. That's right. It's crazy. The makeup for the crowd, uh, in the early scene was totally diverse. I mean, there were, well, diverse uh, well, if it's you just all the sort of marginalized kids who wanted something else, a lot of Bowie fans. Yeah. A, lot, a ton of Bowie fans. Mm, I mean, that was true. kind of the link. Half the crowd from those first Pearls gigs ended up in bands anyways. There's a lot of guys that didn't fit in and stuff. There was a lot of people that found their niche at that point, you know, of people that would accept them, I think. The only place we could play was Tumbleweeds. And that was a little place on 4th Avenue. A little hole in the wall, a dive. It was perfect. The only place in town to get any kind of punk rock music or new music was the record room. And that was run by a couple named Richard and Joe Ramon. They took the name Ramon. And, uh, and then Joe Tamez, Aka Ramon, was the first person in town to start bringing bands from LA in and set up some gigs for us all. So she brought in bands like X and Blasters and the Alley Cats um, to Tumbleweeds. And we would get to open up for them sometimes. Otherwise, all the other bands that were touring were going into Phoenix. Tucson was basically off the map and kind of dead. And downtown was a ghost town, which was nice. Hotel Congress was already up and running, just. And then they began having bands. The Night Train was probably my favorite place to play because the stage was so big. Our drummer at the time had a, a huge drum kit. I uh, would run around back and forth on the stage like a wild child. And the songs were very raw. Fans were just amazing. You know, they'd all come up and dance. And it was just so much fun to just be playing the songs to a lively crowd. It was a great scene. And, and obviously, you know, the record room was the integral part of it all. And we were all just so young and vulnerable with the same ambition. And that's what made the scene possible. It was really phenomenal. And Fourth Avenue was so cool back then. I mean, there were fun stores and bars and restaurants and music venues. That's what, you know, made really the whole thing happen was Fourth Avenue. We played at the night train and at the tumbleweed, so up and down the avenue. Uh, there was some tension between, like, long-haired, maybe established rock and roll guys and the, these new guys that were thought it was better not to know how to play. We did have a riot. Yeah, I guess, I guess we had a little riot on 4th Avenue there. The scene was, was pretty innocent, you know, with the hangers on. There was probably about 50 people, 100 max. We, some of the long hairs really dug it. Some of the older sort of biker uh, Vietnam vet guys, the total gist of it was sort of that we knew we were cannon fodder. And they dug that. They understood our anti-establishment leanings. So some of them sort of protected us, but you have all these other people that really hated it. That's true. You know, I mean, uh, don't you know what a punk is? That's somebody that gets, you know, fucked in prison, right? That would be a typical sort of thing you would hear. But you know, that whole thing about punk being anybody can play and everybody's welcome. I mean, 
I mean, we had all sorts of uh, uh, women in bands in Tucson, and the scene was really inclusive. I think anybody that felt like if they were an outsider were welcome. There were other women in the scene; they just weren't front people. When I was there, you know, I was just I was a young woman at 19. Being a female lead it was never an issue because I felt so much support from all the other musicians and my friends. There just wasn't a big enough scene in Tucson and the recording scene wasn't that big. It, immediately it was, you know, we're, we're off to we're off to L.A. to try and to try and make it big. So if you wanted people nationally to hear what you were doing, you had to get signed to a label. Um, and you had to have national distribution. And th so everybody, you know, for, for rock music, it was really, really centered in California. If you lived in Tucson, LA was extraordinarily accessible. Yeah, was there a migration? Yeah, no, no doubt about it. You were going for the Holy Grail. Like we got to the point with Giant Sandworm, we could play out twice a week, twice a month and make enough money to live on back then. Burritos were buck 25. It was easy living, so we got, and we'd stay up all night and sleep all day and put tinfoil on the windows. And eventually, we thought about taking it somewhere to see how for real we were. So we set our sights for LA, eventually. Got a gig at Madame Wong's. And right before that, the band broke up. Finally, I went out to LA because um, of a botch smash and grab. You know, I got arrested for stealing a twin reverb in a Telecaster. But I went out there figuring if I got a job, I would become LA County's problem and not Pima County. If I was black or brown, I would have been caught up in the system somehow. You know, I at least would have been made to stay here and stay on probation, probably. So instead I was just allowed to go out there and I got a job and uh, the band came later and we started playing and I think it was less than a year or two later, signed to Slash Records, you know, signed to the label everybody wanted to be on. I mean, it was sort of surreal when you think about that that would happen. But they, they were also sweet to us. You know, so the extension of the West, you know, I-10 goes a little farther. It doesn't just stop at Tucson, you know. Uh, you, we're, we're eight hours away from being in, in this different city kind of stagnating in Tucson at the time and we had played almost every room I felt like okay look I'm gonna go to LA and try to get us a deal and then you guys will come out and that didn't happen the, the major labels back in that time uh, to us control everything you know we had to be accepted by one of them and and have them push us uh, in order to to really break and that was stupid uh, of us because uh, we we had uh, we had opportunities to sign like with small labels and could have gotten some stuff out there. Whereas uh, my old band, you know, Pills, Gentleman After Dark, we released a, a little single in 1980, a little EP, and then we made a record in like '83 or something, produced by Alice Cooper and Dick Wagner. And it, you know, I always sit, like to say that that record sounds like a pile of cocaine, and uh, there's a reason for that. Other than that, it's just a stack of demos that were, you know, that's sitting in a box somewhere. You know, we could have had all these records out. And this uh, attempt at rock stardom uh, being, well, not to say that we didn't listen to music. No. <laughs> and love music. I wouldn't have picked up the guitar in the first place if I didn't absolutely love music. Somehow we just got this focus. We wanted to be, you know, some kind of version of Aerosmith or something. I want you to come with me. Back here after uh, years away, uh, it, I grew up here, so uh, it, it feels like home. And I never, you know, I've always come back quite a bit, you know. So in my case, at least, it, it's not really that that big of a change, except I left uh, L.A. behind, which, to be honest, uh, I 
I'm glad. I can't. I, I hate living in L.A. And I love Tucson. I love it. When I say that it was sweet and innocent in Tucson, it was sweet and innocent in most places. And, and I, I really don't think that there was, in the whole United States in 1980, <laughs> 81, I don't think there would have been more than 100 places where you could play that music. There's a, there's a thread that goes from Van quitting in L.A., and um, I think you needed some dental work and- I had a toothache. And, and tired of, of quote unquote, the Danny Stewart rocks show. <laughs> he, he went back and then Naked Prey started. And then Naked Prey wound up the first record, which was on the LA label that really helped us down there, which was Steve Wynn's label from Dream Syndicate. I, I did quit the Danny Stewart rock show, but not spitefully. And, and uh, the first thing I did was when I recorded something here in town. Cause it's burning bright by me. Can all this be real? Somehow I feel like the time is right by me. We never thought about anything but playing locally and then, oh, let's make a record. And then we just thought the path, we never had any ambition, really. It just sort of, except doing the next step that you kind of do, yeah, let's naturally. make a record and, oh, maybe we should go on a tour. And So we just started putting a tour together and we go to play South by Southwest. Then you go, okay, string a bunch of shows along the East Coast. So we just kept playing. We just started calling college radio stations. We're just so naive. Say, hey, we're touring a band. We're the Sidewinders. We'd like to see if you can play our records. So we were sort of like Mr. Magoo traveling through the East Coast, you know, just, oh, let's play a show. We'd get to another club where we weren't actually booked. And we knocked on the door. We don't have a band tonight. Well, I guess you can play. Go ahead and play over there if you want. That kind of tour. And we kind of got good at what we did. Eventually, we ended up knowing that we were going to get this RCA showcase. We had a 45-minute set that was pretty concise. You know, we just don't want to fuck this up. And we get off the stage, and the guy from RCA, the guy from TBT Records, the guy from CBS Records were just all there and saying, God, that was great. We want to sign you. We want to sign you. The RCA goes, you're in. I think if I were to pick the greatest night of my life, it would be that night. It was shocking. It's like, you're kidding me? This is like winning the lottery. I don't really believe it's happening. Unfortunately, by the time we got what I thought was a really good management guy, he got on board and about three months later, Capital dropped us. And we stayed around a little while longer and then ended up going back to Tucson and then going to Europe. To me, I thought it was it was another path. There, I, there was not a, an open door here that I could see. I was already kind of at the, sort of the top of the Arizona heat. So we went to Europe and did that. And that was a lot of fun, but it was really hard work. It was fun, but it lucky didn't kill us. At the end of the 70s, uh, we had a guy from Germany come over and was going to take us over there to tour. He told me, he called one day and just said, I got the worst news in the world. There won't be any tour happening. He says the local bands over where he was from are just playing for nothing. I mean, they're just to get in the door and play, and so we can't afford to get you guys over there. And and it was uh, one hell of a good band that I had put together. They're all doing great things now. And then it was time to put my kid into school. She was five. And I opted to come back to Tucson because it's such a good place to raise up kids. But after all that, after going everywhere, if I can go anywhere, and I can go anywhere, this place just made the most sense. And I realize right now that somewhere in this city, there are kids, especially with COVID, in the garage. There's no basements in Tucson, so they're not in the basement. But they're, but they're in a garage and they're learning how to play together in a room. And what they're doing is rock and roll, and that's beautiful. And what's really changed, I think, is that 
so many people do not stop anymore, right? They just keep going forever. Back in the day, you'd get a good publishing check, and if you wanted to get out of the business, you could open up a restaurant or something. You could get out of the business, you know. Now, so, you know, a lot of time these musicians are stuck in the thing. You have such a commonality when you play music with people and you create things, and you go out and you bomb together or you kill together. The bond that you form is just amazing. It's, it's, it's impossible to really to describe it because there's nothing else like it. And you just want to keep doing that because the high from that, the transcendence that you get from that is unlike anything else. And after a good night, you're just so high. And hopefully the audience has the same high. But, it, but you do it because of those two hours. And the, the two hours make it all worthwhile. Well, I'm back to my drinking, carrying on. All I'm left with is the fact you're a thousand miles gone. I've got to get the money to get me to you. But all I seem to get is just enough to buy. Can you lend me a few for the road? 